coming to this presentation. Uh, for those of you, I think I probably met most of you, although I can't remember everybody's name, unfortunately. Um, my name is Richard Young, and I'm a professor in the Council of Psychology program. And uh, some of the work that I've done is on suicide, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and it's uh, lovely that. Uh, Christine, on behalf of the students and management. One of the things I want to be just sort of clear about at the beginning is that um, uh, a cat. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the most common <laughs> in, 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 in inversion. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the students want something practical, screen, how to screen, how to refer, what to do with uh, a client who's, who is as suicide, as suicidal ideation is kind of manifesting some symptoms, etc. And uh, I said, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so that's not what this is about. I think this will help you clinically. I hope it will help you clinically, but it's not a, a technically focused training session on exactly what to do. There's one handout that we had from a colleague, um, David Rudd, who talks about assessment or screening in a, in a non clinical environment. And uh, it's a part of the PowerPoint presentation, so all the points aren't, aren't uh, collaborative, but it's, it's quite a useful process to be presented. It's not really the, the nature of my um, talk today. The other thing I wanted to start with was, was kind of just a general principle. I welcome your questions as we go along. You don't have to hold them back. We can make this as dialogically relevant as, as possible and just engage with me at any point and engage with each other so I think learning happens when you get to speak rather than just always listening. But I am going to talk. If you don't raise your hand and say something, you might have to bear with, bear, bear with me talking. So, uh, um, suicide is a kind of a um, uh, challenging area uh, for lots of different reasons. But it's an area that counselors have a sort of um, an approach avoidance uh, uh, about. The approach is, of course, and uh, Catherine was telling me that there were a large number, some people I think didn't show up today, maybe because of the weather, but uh, there was a large number of people who actually showed up for this, uh, this session today. It's approach because we want to know about it because it seems this is important and if I have a client who is suicidal, uh, I, I certainly uh, want to be as competent as I possibly uh, can be. But it's also, at the same time, um, something that we avoid, that we, that we run from. In our society, and, and just as, as uh, adults in our society, we play people, there's often a kind of sense that suicide isn't something I want to talk about. Like, even if I think the person is thinking about about killing themselves or they're taking their own lives. It, I don't, if I mention it, it's going to, have to actually precipitate that. And some counselors take on that attitude. And for lots of different reasons, and maybe some of them are useful. I don't think they're, 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 they're appropriate, but maybe it might be, might be uh, in a sense, well motivated in, in some cases. But, but we have each individual in this room has an attitude about suicide, has, a, has a, a feeling about the word suicide, somebody who might be attempting suicide, people trying to have suicidal ideation. And it's important, I think, as the, as the beginning place, to examine our own feelings about it, to know where do we stand, what frightens us, what doesn't frighten, how can I approach, how can I not approach, is it something, which is one of the points of this presentation, one of the ways we deal with our anxiety about suicide as counselors is we come to presentations like this. <laughs> and more importantly, we, or more often I suppose, we uh, um, resort, depend on uh, uh, clinical assessments and clinical judgments. What the, what the DSM say about it? Does the manifest, does she manifest all these symptoms, etc.? We kind of rush to 
assessment Because of our own nervousness, I ask the question. I mean, I'm not saying that, but I'm, because I'm not saying that assessment and screening isn't appropriate and isn't actually needed, but is that our kind of our, our, our safety place because of feelings, attitudes, scariness that we have? So if anything, if, if anything sort of comes out of this today for you, I hope it moves your ability, your, your desire to examine your own feelings about suicide and about facing a client who might be showing symptoms, talking about so talking about suicide, talking about taking their own life, etc. So far, so good. So, um, uh, people who know me, uh, know that I'm interested in something called action theory and action. Uh, this is, I'm constructing this talk around uh, suicide and action, the, kind of the relationship between the two. And uh, one is to kind of think about suicide as action, as goal directed action. And it's a big shift actually I think how we think about suicide because we often think about suicide and even in the clinical sense um, uh, as, as an illness or as the direct cause of an illness. He's clinically depressed, therefore. And it, it has there's there's nothing there's nothing in making that sort of diagnose that label, I won't say diagnosis but that label, there's nothing that that respects the agency of the person. That in effect, when a person decides to take their own life, they're acting very agentically in relationship to their own life. They're not necessarily acting well in terms of their own life. Although they, they see it as, a, as an immediate solution. But they're acting agentically in relationship to their own life. And in some, some respects, some of our diagnostic models want to pull that agency away from them. So we're going to try to look at this a little bit more from, from uh, goal directed action. And that's sort of the second idea that we have is the notion that that um, uh, there's a the suicide doesn't stand by itself in a person's life. It's it's connected. So you know you've been talking with a client for four or five sessions, and they might not have ever mentioned suicide. You have no indication of that. But all that stuff that you've been talking about, um, all the stuff that you've been talking about is absolutely connected with whatever uh, ideation the person has or the person has to take their own life. So, and so to kind of make those links and what are those links? So it's a little bit, a little bit of that focus in the presentation today. So um, where did all this, this arrive from? So if you look up this word Ashi on um, Google it, you'll find after Ashi is a little town in Switzerland, and it um, this is the view from Ashi, Lake Thun, and the issue I'm not sure of the exact pronunciation, if you if you know Switzerland at all. Ashi is a little town where this working group started meeting you know, 12, 13 years ago. And we've met every second year. And it's called the Working Group on Suicide. And we started a small and we sort of expanded a little bit bigger to have uh, these conferences about one of the hundred people clinically oriented conferences. And what, what, the, what the purpose of the, of the group was uh, was to, to improve the therapeutic approach to suicidal persons. So, and that's the kind of, that's in contrast to a uh, diagnostic approach, a high, highly oriented assessment approach, and a high, an, or a, a pharmacologically driven approach. So what's the therapeutic side of trying to respond uh, uh, helpfully to, to people who are suicidal? So um, this is the view from the hotel mm -hmm. the conferences are held. That's the nice part. <laughs> Well, the whole thing is nice. But it isn't. Okay. 
Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. So out of these, uh, so we've had it meant every second year, so there are only six, six conferences that we've had there. This book has emerged called uh, Building a Therapeutic Alliance with the Suicidal Patient. And all the main speakers who, who have spoken and talked about their work over the, over the course are, are, in this, are in this book. So it's, it's a, it's, I think it's a worthwhile book because it deals with, um, it doesn't deal with, uh, with um, diagnosis so much, but it deals a lot with the therapeutic side of uh, suicide. Um, so, um, uh, this 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 um, con this whole series this whole series of conferences was actually stimulated by a research project that I was working on with two Swiss uh, colleagues, um, on uh, the one of the editors of the book, and and um, uh, Vladislav Fowler. And uh, what we did in uh, this whole this presentation, in a sense, is, is Kind of, a, kind of the findings of the study. Not, not, it's not formally presented as the findings of a study, but we, we are, I've depended on, on uh, the study to, uh, for the data that's reported here. But essentially what, what we did was uh, we had 39 people in the study, adults, uh, 17, I think the oldest person was in their 50s, who had attempted suicide. And they attempted suicide in such a way that they had to be hospitalized, not psychiatrically, but in a medical facility. Cut lists, for example. And um, we, not me personally, because they were Swiss-speaking people or German-speaking Swiss people, um, uh, but they were interviewed uh, within a week of that medical hospitalization, so within one week. And in that interview, we actually asked them a very simple kind of question is, uh, tell me about what led you to make this attempt on your life. And then kind of amplify that, very sort of phenomenologically oriented. We also did something which people who, who know me will be quite familiar with, but um, after, the, after this interview, <coughs> And the, the person interviewing them was a psychiatrist, so that was the whole context. After the interview, um, we then asked the, the person, they, uh, they were patients in the sense that we used the word patients because they were hospital patients at the time, um, was asked to do this, what we call the self-confrontation interview. In other words, they were asked to look back at the videotape. Uh, we stopped the videotape uh, between, around every minute and we ask them again, uh, what were you thinking or feeling and feeling at that time you were telling your story to the psychiatrist? So we went through their whole interview with that notion of them uh, confronting. When we, um, well, let me ask you a question. I have to get your involvement here. Good idea or not? Who would you to do that, to do that second step? Any, what would be the merits, what might be the key merits of it? When was the follow-up? Pardon me? When was the follow-up? The, the follow-up, oh, it was right immediately, like that second interview, that looking back at the, it was, yeah. was immediately after, like five, within five minutes or ten minutes of, of the first interview. So it wasn't like weeks later? It wasn't weeks later, no, it was right, it was right at that time. Well, you're going to get a lot more richer understanding. You're going to get a lot more. Because they're obviously not going to be talking about everything they thought and felt as they actually thought they told right. the story. You're going to get a lot more. You're going to get a, a, a very uh, more of an understanding. And and what you what we really saw in those interviews, which was so fascinating, was that um, you know in 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 in, in 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 people who've attempted suicide in that suicidal act, there's a there's a great deal of dissociation. In other words, dissociation means, you know, you define dissociation, but that's not uh, fair to do, right? Eh? <laughs> do you want to tell us? No, you go. Okay. <laughs> um, dissociation is, um, uh, in a sense, uh, you're, you're cut off from your feelings, 
from your thinking and from, and from, from your physical feelings, not only your emotional feelings, but your, your, your physical feelings. So that's why a person can actually cut their wrists, which, you know, I mean, to me, sounds like, how could you possibly do that? Just because I don't want to, I don't, I don't want the pain. They, they, they become dissociated from the pain. They can actually watch that experience of cutting. So th these, these, people, these uh, participants, research participants we had, would have likely uh, participated in some sense, some degree of dissociation. And um, uh, what the, this self-confrontation interview did, the second interview, actually let you see yourself, let the patient see themselves, as a person who can narrate a story. I have a story. I have something that I can say, and I can say it in my, like, I'm, I made the story. I told the psychiatrist this was important, and this happened, and this didn't happen, and when this, blah, blah, blah. I did that. I created my story. Um, when, we, when we showed some of these tapes that we had, permission to do these at uh, one of our study groups. Um, one of the, one of the uh, uh, Israel Orbach, who's, who's now deceased, but is a, 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 quite a famous Israeli psychologist in the, in the field of suicidology, said he had seen nothing stronger, no stronger technique to deal with the issue of suicide, uh, of, of dissociation than this notion of the, the, the video playback. That when the person actually can see themselves experiencing, can see themselves as narrating uh, their, their, their lives. So uh, the data that we had for these 39 people was based on those two, two uh, uh, data points, if you will, or two kinds of data. Mm -hmm. Yes? Just wondering a little bit about the ethics, um, ethics behind doing a method like that. Whether, in some cases, the individuals did have flooding, and whether, like some of their, because it was right after, right? So the it was within a week of the actual attempt. Yes. Yeah, and then the five minutes. Yeah, right after. Right. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I mean, I we didn't have we didn't run into any problems like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of 39. Uh, secondly, uh, they were they were in a hospital at the same time. The second interview was done by a psychologist. The first interview was done by a psychiatrist. Uh, so we felt pretty confident that we were, you know, that, that people could make good clinical judgments as they as as, they, as the patients engaged in this. And a second yeah. question, because it's such a eye-opening experience and it's very mindful for them to be in that space where their supports or meetups subsequently too, like a week after or two weeks after? Well, um, this is the context mm -hmm. which is which is quite interesting. Um, we actually had, well, I shouldn't say we, but because uh, I'm, I'm not uh, part of this particular research program, but uh, Conrad Mikel has continued with a research project now where he's using this as a treatment intervention. But not just the two, the two interviews, uh, four, uh, four sessions of which this self-confrontation is one of them, because we think of as some power. And he's, using, he's doing this as a research project because, and, and the, the reasons that Unlike other uh, mental health, mental health issues, when a person makes a suicide attempt and then it's over the suicide attempt, they show much less uh, willingness to go to come for treatment. So, if I'm suffering from anxiety, for example, and it's getting into in the, in the way of my life, or I'm suffering from depression, it's getting in the way of my life on a daily basis. I'm not the kind of want to go to treatment if I'm disposed at all to seek help. If I've made a suicide attempt, 
at least, I'm, you know, this is the statistics. And so I, I'm, I'm in a position where, well, it's over, and I want to sort of forget about it. And there's very, there's very poor follow-up um, for uh, people who have attempted suicide in terms of their willingness to, to come for treatment. So we now have a, have, a, have a, they have a project going where they're using this as a treatment society to see if they can actually increase, uh, increase the, the willingness of people to come for treatment after they've left the hospital. Uh, so I'm, did that answer your question? Sorry. In a way, it's almost like a positive way of seeing if yeah. it's going to have an effect on yeah. them for them to come back. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, like what research is that based on? Or like a lack of? Like interest to come back. Well, we're, we're test, they're testing it, but because it because the the, the rationale is that uh, um, this is a we think a powerful technique. This notion it's not just the self it's not just the self confrontation. There's not two other interviews that the person takes takes part in, but, but this notion of seeing myself touches the person, the person sees themselves as, an act, as a person who is an agent, an active person, a person who takes action in their lives. And the action, of course, and there's one action of doing, of, of making an attempt on their lives, but the, the other actions, of course, is me as a creator of my narrative, of my story, of making meaning across this, well, across not only this, the, 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 the incident of the suicide, Okay, I'm way off. I'm way off. We have we have one more question. Oh, one more question. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Um, so, um, just two two more pieces. One is it's all, is it all words in terms of the story, or is there other modalities of art that are used? And in relation to that, it also sounds like you're inviting them engage in an aesthetic response with themselves. Like you're bringing them into a felt sense of the experience. And I, I don't know if that's being talked about as part of this, or well, is it? Um, we haven't done, we didn't do that in this study, uh, in terms of art, or doing any other modality other than talking. But there's, nobody over here is going to do that. Uh, for the cases. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> um, should, should I have said that? Again? <laughs> you hope. Um, uh, <clears throat> there's certainly an emotional, I don't know if aesthetic sense, but there's certainly an emotional feeling. And, uh, you know, there are uh, occasions um, that we really use, because we've used this in a lot of different settings, but some people have a, have a reaction of saying, um, when they're, con when they're confronted, if you saw by this by this videotape of themselves, I can't look at that. It's too scary. It's too, you know. So that's a, that's not exactly what you're saying, but that is part of your reaction. So there's a range of reactions of people uh, responding to this. Okay. So um, so the ashing work is what we're trying to address for these two basic questions. Accounting for subjective experience. Not thinking of it all in the diagnostic categories, but seeing what the person who is suicidal is experiencing, and then to uh, balance what we call clinician-centered versus client-centered approaches. Because a lot, especially when you kind of come from the medical establishment, um, you know, it's, it's pretty much, as you know, like going to your family doctor, pretty, it's pretty much doctor focused. Like I'm interested, in, I have the, I'm going to make the diagnosis and I'm going to give you a prescription and, and that's it. And, uh, so we were trying to sort of balance this, this notion of meeting a, meeting a suicidal person uh, from a more client and therapeutic uh, perspective. So out of this group, uh, we initially developed uh, six uh, recommendations, and they're on one of the handouts, uh, meeting the suicidal person, guidelines for clinicians. I'm not sure I'm going to uh, go through all of these. Uh, um, uh, I'm 
mean, you know, these 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 uh, six principles. I don't know if you, if you read them, you might say, well, that's pretty much what we're doing in counseling. It's pretty much pretty uh, uh, common sense from a counselor's perspective, and I think it is common sense from a counselor's perspective. But there's lots of people in the mental health field that don't have our counseling perspective. You know, sort of like you notice the shared understanding. And it's an important thing that I actually can 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 understand. You see, it's sort of like one thing I can understand that you're disappointed that my client is disappointed because uh, their marriage is unfortunate. It's another level of a shared understanding when I say I can understand that you are suffering so much that you want to take your own life. And to kind of move towards that level of understanding, that level of shared understanding, is, uh, of course, it is, it's, it's a lifetime challenge for all of us to do that. And it's practically going back to some of that resistance we have about suicide, about that fear that we have about suicide uh, generally. So that's one of the, one of the, the, the features of these, of these things. Um, the... Uh, The therapist's attitude is non-judgmental and supportive. Well, you know, perfectly well. But, you know, but we lose that supportiveness because we become fearful. And that's not a, a challenge for us. Here, here's the critical thing, I think. The next one is the actually the one that I think is one of the most, uh, um, well, this, this uh, new model is what we're the action approach is the new model, but um, where do you go? Yeah, we, we have to phrase it like we that. The interview should start with the patient's self-narrative. So, um, and this is that, sort of that link between narrative and action, but we do narrate our, our lives and our stories. And, um, there's a little bit of a of a uh, pull of bias. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. And I'm going to for the in Westminster Clinic. This I can't tell you what exactly happened in the baby states, but but let me tell you what what happened when I was going there as a supervisor. Um, we were pretty much into reinforcing what people had learned in 362. Help the client identify feelings, reflect feelings, stay with the client, and etc. That's what we did. Is that the way it is now? Sort of. Um, I think that's good because it's a training facility, and I think all of those things are important. But I think sometimes what we lose in that is not encouraging the client's own storytelling, own self narrative in, in doing that. And with uh, people who are feeling suicidal or have actually attempted to uh, take their lives, there is a story. And we should, at the beginning of our work with them, hear the story. And maybe not be quite so, I mean, encourage the story to be told, but maybe not be quite so uh, fastidious about uh, the reflection of feeling all the time, you know, kind of. Uh, all the time. But then you have to, you have to work with your own supervisors on that. But <laughs> it's just the notion that I have that, and what, what our data says is that this, this suicide experience didn't arise from nothing. It's embedded in a, in a much, in a specific event, but in a longer life life experience. And I, I, it's important for the client to say that life experience, to create that life experience. And then if they have the opportunity to do that self-confrontation where they can see it back again, uh, so much better. Um, so anyways, you can look these over. Yeah, the ultimate goal, of course, is to engage the patient in a therapeutic relationship. So it's not very hard to understand. But. So in this, in these, this, yes, um, 
they ask for new models to understand suicide, and that's to move away a little bit from, uh, you know, there's some very old models. Um, uh, suicide is a sin from the Middle Ages. Suicide is a crime against the law who actually commits suicide for more recent times. Those are models. Suicide is a disease. That's a, that's a kind of a current model. Um, so we're saying suicide is an action. That's, a, that's, our, that's the model I'm, I'm going to present. Uh, in, uh, suicide as co-directed action. So, um, uh, and, and the reason why, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on this whole theory of our action, but the reason why we, we have this is that you understand, you and I, and looking at other people, you look at your neighbor, you understand what they're doing as goal, as goal director. She's doing that too. She's doing that to get a good mark in this course. She's doing that to do this. She's doing that to, 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 for this particular person. We don't tend to explain our own behavior in terms of causes. She's, she's doing that because she grew up in a privileged uh, socioeconomic environment in a particular culture. We don't tend to explain, even though that's not, not saying that's not true. But that's not how we live our lives. We live our lives in terms of, of, of the, that towards which we are uh, going or what, that towards which other people are going. And so the same thing, we have to think of the same thing in terms of suicide, both how, how we should understand, how we might understand suicide and how the people who might be feeling suicide are, are experiencing their own. So that's the notion of action. And then we have this uh, uh, table which uh, will spend uh, a few minutes on But just to show the complexity of action. So in one column, we have the notion of, of actions. There are things that we do. We came to this lecture this afternoon. I came to give this lecture. It's an action. It's goal-directed. It's, you know, and, but, but, but our lives aren't lived only in actions. Actions, we make sense of actions, and we make other people's sense of actions in terms of the project, that the way actions kind of are constructed or linked together. And that we would call um, a project. So we call uh, projects. So this may be in your head, for you. How do I become a good therapist project? Or how do I, um, I don't know, waste Wednesday afternoon? <laughs> how do I spend Wednesday afternoon? We I mean, have all kinds of different projects. How do I get away from uh, my kids because they're on spring break and I have to go to school? <laughs> Anyways. Um, I'm sure it's the how to become a good therapist project. But, but anyway, you link several actions. And how to become a good therapist project isn't just coming here. Of course, lots of other things that you do to become a good therapist. And then, so there's projects. And we make sense of our lives. And of course, it's not just to do the suicide. It's to do everything. And then we have, when projects extend across a lifetime, and they're important to us, we can use the word career. And I'm not using the word career in the occupational sense. So you can talk about a parenting career, or a marriage career, or you can talk about an occupational career if, that's, if such is that. For lots of people today, occupation isn't a career. Occupation is a, it's a more of a project. I'm going to do this for this little bit of time in my life. So career doesn't, but there are ways that we make sense across time of big chunks of our lives. And we would put the word in the career. So now this, uh, so continuity, of sense making, of goal directedness. And then we have uh, sort of the dimensions of this, these, these actions, projects, and careers. And one is at the level of meaning. So uh, uh, this is meaningful for me, I, or not meaningful. Uh, I have goals, I can articulate them, uh, society articulates them with me, my partner articulates and shares, etc. cetera, blah, blah, blah. The level of meaning. There's goals. And then, but there's also, at the same time, steering processes that go on. So everything isn't just meaning. It's also emotions and feelings and thoughts and cognitions. 
that allow me to do. So I'm thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you that question. You know, I'm gonna, and, and it's automatic and it's fast, but sometimes it's more deliberate and slow. And, and something's going on. It's a process that I'm going to initiate to, to get some kind, to, to reach some kind of goal, to reach some kind of level of meaning. And then there are um, unconscious processes, of which there are many, driving my behavior, driving my steps, my processes, driving which eventually deal with my meaning. There's structural supports. The fact that I'm not freezing to death allows me to give this lecture. I'm not outside. Uh, the resources we have, Catherine came and got organized, etc., and, and a million other things, certain skills, etc. So that's the, sort of that framework in which we can understand action, projects, and careers. And the next slide says, at this level, we don't have any evaluative. This is just life. This can be good or bad. My project, my career, my project can be get street drugs, or get and take street drugs. And sometimes that project of getting and taking street drugs becomes a career because I have all of my life is devoted to either getting them, taking them, or coming down from them, or dealing with their consequences. And that's my, because my career, if you will. Uh, so it can be, but, but my career can be uh, becoming a university professor and, or uh, raising children. And those are, we, we, we would generally call them life enhancing careers versus uh, life detrimental careers. And so we can put uh, qualities on this. And we have this just kind of notion that both of these are working. And any, any client who is suicidal may be having trouble with meaningful actions or motivated projects or a life enhancing career. And indeed, suicide itself we would typify in this model as life, a life detrimental career. It's, it's, it's bringing this big picture, making sense across time, to some kind of an end. So uh, there are a value of things. Uh, and we have identified what we think are all of these characteristics. I'm not going to deal with it, but we have sort of characteristics for each of these boxes. And if you wanted to, I'm not suggesting this, we could use this as a kind of diagnostic to see where a person is. Where is their difficulty vis-a-vis -vis action or project or career? What are they, what are they uh, uh, lacking? So you might find a person who's not unable to in, in, engage in life, in a life enhancing career because they can't attend or don't attend to emotional issues. And that's, that's detrimental. Or uh, other people, adequate structural supports. You know, in one, another research project that I was doing a number of years ago, uh, a kid wanted to talk, a young man, a young 13-year-old boy, wanted to have a better relationship with his mother. His mother was a single mother. And he said, the problem is, that both of them acknowledge that this mother, because she was a single mother, had to have two jobs. And she was never home in the evening. And they both said, well, there's no time for us to talk together. There's no time for us to be together because my mom is always away. That's a structural support that's going to allow some kind of participation in a joint project between mother and son to happen. That's, if it's not there, it's, not, it's going to be a problem, problematic. So we think this is kind of comprehensive, but it's not really the point of my, my talk. So all of this comes out of these kinds of people. It's, it's on your, it's on your uh, on the handout. And then out of this comes this notion of what is our image of the person? And our image of the person is we have intentions. We, we, this is my intention. This is my plan. This is what I'm doing here. And this is what I'm going to plan to do tomorrow or this afternoon or this evening or with my life or on my holidays. I'm intentional. Our clients are intentional. And then um, we create our social world. And this is maybe a little bit of a shift for some people. I mean, we create our social world through joint actions, through doing things together with other people. So 
you know, the, the, the alternate image to this is you sit in a big chair, big easy chair in your bedroom, and you do your meditation by yourself, and that's where you create your world. Now, I'm not saying don't sit in a big easy chair in your bedroom and do your meditation, because I think that's a good thing. But you create your world by your interaction, by what you do. You create, you construct together with other people. And sometimes you don't have to even be with the people to, to, to do that construction. So I can be thinking about person X or context X and, and act based on that, not because they're physically present to me at that particular moment. And that my image of the person, this image of the person, is that I'm able to perform deeds for which I'm responsible. That I can actually do, I have to be, I have, I'm not just an automaton being uh, manipulated by whomever or whatever the stars. I can actually be responsible for, for what I do. So that's the image of the person uh, that we have. So, uh, time is Leading, Catherine. Maybe we should take a two-hour walk. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this next rather quickly, so the numbers will correspond to the data. So I'm going to stay the principles in five or six slides, and then we're going to see some numbers. The numbers don't appear, or all the numbers don't appear on your hand that I changed it last night when I was kind of looking over this. Number. Suicide can be organized as projects. Uh, actions, projects, and career. It's the first principle. I'm going to illustrate this later on. Second principle, joint actions and projects and career are social, relational, goal-directed processes. So we ultimately think that suicide is something I do by myself. And in some respects, you do. When, you, when we talk to these 39 patients and every other client that I've spoken to who feels suicidal, it's always, uh, it's always situated relationship. Not always, I would not say it's always about a relationship, but it's always situated relation. It's about the context. It's about who stands around and in, in opposition, in a sense, to that particular person. Um, and sort of the corollary of that is that Contacts with other people prior to and after a suicide action can be used for preventive prison. And we know one of the simple things that if a client is feeling suicidal, one of the simple things that you can do as a counselor, of course, is, is to ask them, who is available to you? Whom do you live with? When are they available? Do you have time? Can you always contact them, etc., etc., to know the contact. And uh, the helplines, like the crisis center helpline, for example, work on this principle. That when you have somebody around to contact, it's, it, 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 it can serve a very preventive and preventive way. Of course, sometimes contact with other people prior to a suicide attempt can actually precipitate suicide. That's another issue. And here's the people who will be interested in trauma. Uh, I'll use the word trauma here, but, but um, a lot of the People in our, no, all the people in our, in our study uh, told about hurtful emotional experiences in uh, childhood and related back to a suicide death. So it's a good factor. So and again, of course, in, 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 in saying it's a factor in suicide, of course, it's, it's, it's the person's subjective experience of it doing a test, not doing a statistical analysis of predicting. It's saying, but when you talk to the person, the person says, yes, this was important. I was never acknowledged by my parents or by my father or by you know, I had this abusive situation. Uh, steering, and steering, so that second level, and steering is action. Uh, we can use top-down processes or bottom-up processes, and I'm going to explain that, so I'm going to do an completely. Okay, now going back to seeing these illustrations, and I was going to ask somebody. So as an action, think of this action, this, this actual attempt that somebody makes on their life. It's filled with all of these things. 
interactions, feelings, thoughts, emotion, pain, state of mind, needs of suicide, knowing the needs, fantasies about the future, and, and, and interruptions. So when you're, if you think of working with a client who might be uh, uh, close to suicide, then they're going to have all of these things. They're going to be manifesting these things in some kinds of ways. And how that gets, uh, initially, there's an intense emotional monitoring. They feel at a certain kind of intensity, but then there's the dissociation, the switch off, the altered monitoring during the action itself. I'm going to read something from, from this. From, from one, it's, in our, it's in our chapter in this book, but it's from our data set. So uh, this is what a young female patient said uh, uh, who had seriously cut her wrists. She offered the following narrative. This is the action. So you might see some of these things in this in which you described. My mother dropped by it was Sunday. I had been suffering for several months after my boyfriend had left me. It seemed to me as if I was being supervised 24 hours for 24 hours. And she told me that uh, knowing that I was suffering was a heavy burden for her, which I knew, there was a big argument between my mother and me about how I felt controlled by her. And I said many things that one should not say to a mother, but it just came out like a pressure cooker. Uh, after which she left and I felt guilty. I should not have said what I had in that way. I knew I had hurt my mother very much. It was painful for me and I wanted and I simply wanted to know whether there was a possibility to stop the pain. Uh, and I had been listless for months. I was crying. And now, and now even doing this, uh, she meant well. I did not see any way out. I could not go any further. Afterwards, I went to the bathroom uh, where I had razor blades. And I looked at them. And I thought whether cutting would hurt. Afterwards, I tried it, first on the upper arm, and it did not hurt at all. Then I watched how it bled, and it was nothing special. Then I cut myself on the wrist. So you see this altering, this intensive cognitive and the altering state that she's going into now. But, but, but the point, of course, is not, this is she, she's describing this. She's telling this very story. It's not, it's not sort of made up by a clinician. It's a person telling it. Anyway, um, then I watched how I bled, and it was nothing special. Uh, then I cut myself on the wrist and put uh, the arm into water and watched the rings, which were pretty. I was simply watching myself doing this. In the previous months, I had withdrawn into myself, watching myself, and now I did the same thing. I was completely detached from my feelings. And then I cut again. And then suddenly, uh, it did not look nice. And I knew it was deep enough. And I got frightened. And I was not inside of myself anymore. And I knew uh, if I did not do something, I would die. So that's that suicide and goal-directed action. You can see it so clearly uh, in my sense of, of this, uh, of all of these things happening. Okay? Convinced it's an action. <laughs> it's also a project. I've got the little quotations on the slide. So it's a personal identity project. So here's this narrative from a different person. I was always a bit depressed. I'm not a very social person. I'm not very spontaneous. I always had problems with my weight, but I never thought of killing myself. I'm a quiet person. Connecting that with the who, I am, who am I as a person, even a physical, even my physical uh, uh, side. And um, with um, uh, an illness career, or um, well, even career because of the number of years here, we have to have a culture, but career. I was playing once with the idea of killing myself. I was 20 at the time, 20 years ago. I did not want to live anymore as I was ill. I had not the feeling, I had the feeling that I cannot go on like that anymore. So something which has spanned this person's life for, for 20 years in some respects. So the suicide as project. Catherine, you're waving, is that what you're? No, I'm not, okay. It is uh, getting close to a time. 
Okay, the second principle that I talked about as relational, um, well, I mentioned this, suicide attempts are explained as relational disappointments and problems. That's the context. Uh, a long-term uh, relationship career with parents. I've had problems with my parents. My father left when I was three years old and he'd been promising things. I had been promising things all the time, but he never showed up. He's not a father for me. 17-year-old woman. Project with partners. I was hanging out, I was hanging on that man a lot because we went through, uh, we, because I think I went through uh, three sexual abuse attempts. I felt he wouldn't do it. As far as this was concerned, he was misusing my trust. Two months ago, it nearly happened again. Absolutely. Not only about the current relationship, but about previous relationships. Just possible. Um, um, this is more not the past, but the future project of establishing relationships with, in this case, within the whole time I had relationships problems with them. Early I had problems because I was too fat now. I had problems because I'm not, not because I'm too thin, but because I'm too extreme. They are frightened. Um, and then the third point, uh, those who are involved in the client's suicide actions, projects, and careers can provide a life-saving link between the client and the health professional. I don't have any quotes for that, but I think you can imagine uh, these, these cases. Um, and uh, extreme emotional experiences that are intrusive, trauma, Distorted cognitive emotional monitoring of the action, thinking about how that so um, uh, trauma rec is recognized by the person, is seen by the person, oftentimes at a sort of an unconscious level. We see it in our actions, but we don't understand why it's happening and necessarily think that that's the cause of it. So we don't always have control. Uh, that would happen in, in um, this, this, this cognitive emotional monitoring of suicide as well. Um, the, current, the, current, the current situation in my life is, is perceived, is interpreted as existentially threatening. Who I am is, can't exist. Okay, so what are top down and bottom up processes? It's a kind of say that, that, that thinking, a client's thinking about suicide can come from, from either direction. It can be something like the person said, I've been thinking of suicide for 20 years. And it can be something that's completely, I've never thought about suicide, and five minutes later, as we see in one of the cases here, I'm, I'm jumping off a balcony. Um, Top down versus bottom up. Uh, top down versus bottom up processes. So the top down process is the person has decided at some previous time to attempt suicide. And it's linked to life goals. I, I'm not being satisfied. I can't reach what I want to do. I can't have the relationship I want, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's cognitive. It's rational. There's no other way out. It's premeditated. And, um, a number of suicides, of course, are committed. People uh, make efforts to get, get uh, whatever means they're going to do it, they go to a place where they think they can do it without being interrupted, etc. And so there's a, there's a, we can understand that suicide, to some extent, is committed. And we have a chance in counseling, actually, or with our clients, to, to, to note that's the ones that are more obvious to us because they might say it or they might talk about it. And of course, we know that one of the one of the signs, of course, is having a means, having a time knowing when you're going to do it, etc. All of those kind of characteristics are, uh, should be of concern to us and a warning sign to us that this person is more likely to commit suicide. If I say I have suicidal relation, but I don't know the means, don't have the means, don't know the place, etc., have supports in my life, then it's less likely that it will happen. You have to still be cautious about it, but this will be. So there are top down processes for suicide uh, uh, actions. Um, 
So here's a, here's a quotation. I made the decision to commit suicide a long time ago. Only the last straw that broke the camel's back was missing. I thought about it very often, but never had the courage. Because of my eating disorder, my husband has, was not able to go on like, like this anymore. He wanted to move out. That was decisive. I couldn't imagine life without him. And then, it can also be a bottom-up process. The thinking can be bottom-up. Starts with smaller components, builds to larger units, uh, words, phrases, movements, thoughts being, are, begin to be linked. Uh, rather than sort of, sort of with a specific goal, so words like emotional, uh, impulsive, etc., are words that key you, not because the person's, not because your client might be saying suicide, but they key you because they're the kind of words that make a per that that are indicative of a person who might act impulsively and on the spur of the moment. So, um, I should have a longer quotation from this particular person in the chapter, but um, there was an internal restlessness. I asked my sister if I could come to visit her because I was not able to go to work because I was frightened that I might faint in the garden. I was, um, I was afraid of, faint, uh, of fainting and never waking up again. My thoughts were too much for me. I don't know if this is No, it doesn't continue. But what happened, what, this, what else she said in this, was that I went to my sister's. We were having tea in her kitchen. She was on the third floor of an apartment building. The door to the little deck uh, was open. And I just got the sense I wanted to run out and jump off. And that's what she did. And she was quite seriously injured, but she, she survived. So that was that, that impulsive bottom up. Not that she had ever planned that what she was going to do, but it was an impulsive moment. But, but the rest of it, the internal restlessness, the, the feeling of life was kind of weighing me down and things weren't going right and I couldn't get out of it, was part of that bottom up thinking. So, um, what are the implications for practice? Well, um, conceptualize the therapist client relationship as whole directive. Well, I mean, maybe that's kind of obvious, but oftentimes we uh, don't think of us, the client, and me uh, working together towards a common goal. And I think that's what we have to kind of think about. It's not me doing something for them, it's us working together. But goal directed. What is the goal? And I don't mean uh, goals like uh, uh, I, I mean sort of in 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 goals in the situation. What is the goal of this moment of this session? What are we doing in here? What are we trying to do with each other? You know, if you went back to the work in, in Rogers, it would be called immediacy. What is the what, is, what are we negotiating and what are we doing? Um, uh, strive for goal-directed action and counseling. Give the client space to construct the narrative. It means not too much talking, but they know uh, Support their life-enhancing projects. So it's not just a matter of kind of being a negative. What are the kinds of things that are going on in their lives that work? You know, people have come at this from different perspectives. Solution focused counseling is one kind of example of that. But, but this is the kind of thing, what are the projects that, that are enhancing for my life? Not to ignore talks about suicidal ideation, concerns, the negative side, but how does that fit and what they relate to our, our enhancing problems? And um, um, of course, not something I have to tell you folks in this program, uh, but some, <laughs> with, with some groups you have to say this. Recognize emotional experiences. You can't uh, do without recognizing that all these experiences, career, big career, big life, the smaller projects, smaller actions, have emotional content. And as counselors, we have to recognize that. That's where we're existing. That's where we, we, they and we can, can, can get access to it. 
and a spe another specific strategy is to try to construct, of course, specific incidences into larger life, larger life stories, and uh, relating goals, small goals to bigger goals. That's a positive strategy. How do we have these small goals fit into the larger life goals? And if I'm not mistaken, that's the end. Thank you. Questions, comments? Dr. Young. Do you want to leave? Because it would work. That's okay, too. Yes, so, go ahead. in clinic, um, with a few of the clients where if they've, uh, they've come up with um, a narrative around their attempts, it's constantly been risk assessment. Yeah. So, how do you negotiate between you know, the responsibility of the therapist, especially in a learning environment, to make sure that they're not going to um, commit um, to this? but also allowing the time for the narrative. And then along with that, if you're saying that once the attempt is made, then individuals don't often want to talk about it, how do you re-engage them in that narrative? Uh, well, two good questions. So um, first of all, um, when this is what's on the other hand there. Uh, this is um, one by David Rutt, who's an American psychologist, suicide so he's got some good points here about how to do this screening. Um, so the first, the, your first question was, you want to ask Yeah. The negotiation. Well, how do you negotiate risk assessment? Okay. So there's an important, uh, you, have to, you have to understand this. And you have to be aware of what is the risk of this person ending their life uh, making an attempt on their life. So that's an important kind of thing. And there are means to do that. Um, one of the important means is at the New West Clinic, for example, or in your clinical setting, is to know that you have a supervisor and to consult with your supervisor so that you don't feel alone in that, um, in that moment. So, and, the, and you should go through the, the, the risk assessment protocol and make a referral. And sometimes make a referral, and I mean, your supervisor and I know. Um, the director of their doctor, uh, the, the newest, the counselor, Joanne, Joanne, Joanne yeah, um, uh, is, is concerned about this. So I mean, maybe taking the person or going with the person to the hospital to emergency, etc. But you know, of course, emergency isn't the solution to suicide. Emergency, going to emergency isn't a solution to suicide because they don't know, they know less about what to do with suicidal patients than you do. So, some of you, I'm sure. Um, so it's not always a solution, but it's a, it's a way at least we know we're acting to get them um, appropriate psych psychiatric care if, if they can make a referral and get them care. Uh, so, so your supervisor and Dr. Miker, appropriate people to work with when you have that. At the same time, however, this person is kind of manifesting Suicidal, some kind of suicidal ideation, thinking about it, talk, talking about it a little bit, or I'm suspecting it from other characteristics. Okay, I'm not going to be therapy. I'm not going to be help. I'm not going to be therapeutic with that person anymore. I'm going to run to my risk management and not think there's a client with whom I still have to have a relationship and still should have a therapeutic relationship. So that's the balance, and you've got to exercise that. But it, knowing that you have a supervisor at the time will help you balance that. But I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is don't abandon the therapeutic side in, the, in favor of the risk assessment and getting the client into my office as fast as possible because I don't want to be responsible. I mean, I know that's the tendency, and that's what you're feeling. But. Okay, so the second part is uh, how, do you, how do you continue to engage them? Well, you continue to engage them, or you can engage them, at that time or subsequently, if you're therapeutic. I mean, if you're actually dealing with their life, their narratives, their construction, not only about the su if, it, if there was an attempt at suicide, not only about the suicide attempt or the suicide ideation, but the other life projects, the self-enhancing life projects, the motivated projects in which they're engaged in in their lives, uh, and looking at the relationship between those two, I think that's how you, I think that's how you do it. So, not to abandon, um, uh, not to abandon a client because they say something about I think you're in the middle. Is that? Right. Okay. Jill. 
Sure. So, I don't know who wants to be next. Too. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess a comment and a, and a question. Um, I, I really appreciate this conception of, of suicide as, a, as an action and um, I sort of see it as like, destigmatizing, as sort of, you know, this is somebody has done something, they've done something or they've thought something. But I sort of notice in the language we're using still, we still talk about the suicidal person, like, even the title of the book. And it still seems rooted in that medical model of, like, this is a person, this is a suicidal person rather than a person who's had a thought or a person who's done an action. Um, which is just a, a, an observation. Yeah. And I guess kind of connected to that, my question was about, um, you're talking about the statistics about um, poor follow-up, and I'm wondering if they've looked at, you know, so people who've attempted suicide are very unlikely to then pursue help, and I'm wondering, has that, has that been looked at as, rather than a function of the fact that they've attempted suicide, and more a function of the fact that someone who's attempted suicide may have had really bad experiences with therapeutic engagement in the past, they've gone seeking help and they've had, you know, bad, bad problems because they've dealt with somebody who hasn't been able to deal with their suicidal thoughts or has labeled them or, you know, has that been looked at? Well, I, I don't know. I, mean, I can answer that question partially. So I first thought, well, I'll get back to this, this like the first point you made later, but um, I, I, don't, I don't have these statistics uh, at hand. But, so I don't know the, the context if this is the United States or Europe or where it was. Uh, something like 80% of people who attempt suicide have seen a medical or mental health professional in the three weeks preceding the suicide attempt. So there's something going on <laughs> where we, and, and, and it's not, it's not counseling, I mean, it's something like medical doctors, family doctors, I mean, it's the last thing they want to hear. It's like our 10 minutes with you, we've been paid for 10 minutes or 12 minutes, whatever. I don't want complicated, I can deal with being grown toning but that's, I, I, don't want to, I don't mean to say that in a, in a, in a, in a facetious way, but I, I, that does happen in a sense. So yes, uh, I think that people may be looking for help and not getting it. And I, I don't know, I don't want to make oversimplify, it was complex and it's serious, but I do think that uh, if we, if, if, if we're afraid then that gets manifest to them in some ways. Yeah. There were other questions. Um, the two, does the models, um, so if we're talking about the action theory model, does its conceptualizations of the action and its sort of the languaging of it, does that get translated to, like if that's your conceptualization of what's going on with the client, does that get translated to what's exchanged with the client? Because um, if there are different levels of awareness around a person's suicide attempt, like you read the one here of the woman who was more about experiencing the pain and observing it, and then it sort of, when she realized that she had some deeply, it shifted real quickly mm -hmm. to like a life saving action. So I'm just wondering, like, do you, in, in the, the, the sort of the theoretical model you guys are looking at, is it more of like a, a clinical conceptualization that maybe doesn't get, like how do you language it with the client if you're taking a whole, an action theoretical model? It, would some clients not look at their action as goal-directed? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not, uh, you don't, I mean, never uh, never with a client do you want to try. <coughs> now we're going to, you know, you're kind of feeling like life is just a bit ready to fall in on top of you and I want to tell you about goal-directed action. I, I wouldn't do that. No. So I'm not, you're not going to explain a model, explain a theoretical position, but I am going to sort of f focus on what goals the client might have. So in my mind, but you know, going back to this, this um, sort of table we have, right back here. Um, it suggests to me that any particular client may have problems in one or other area, one or other of these areas. And so if, um, let's imagine a client is dealing with issues around positive feedback or feeling that you know, not getting reinforcement, et cetera, et cetera. I may want to deal with those kinds of issues in, in counseling. Um, if, for example, a person 
isn't feeling emotionally functional, can't access emotions. So I want to do, I want to use my, my therapy if that might be more emotionally focused. So I'm letting go of uh, some of the other things because this client may need more to develop more emotional functionality. How to, how to, how to be emotional and receive emotion. How to access my own emotions and understand them to express them. I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going in to that emotionally focused therapy session with the with I'm not, I'm, I'm going, with with the with the eyeglasses or the, the the perception perspective of an emotionally focused therapy that's all I do or everything is emotionally focused because I've got a big range here. But for this client or in this session or at this time in the session, I'm going to use more emotionally focused approaches. So this gives me quite a range. And you know, we can get into sort of lifelong meaning. Or even well, lifelong meaning. Uh, that um, uh, we talked in another slide, we talked about uh, existentially threatening situations. Well that's the counter action of lifelong meaning. This is this is meaning. This is an emotion, this is meaning, this is existentialism. This is my existentialist counseling theory coming into, may come into play, or may come into play for part of it. Some of this uh, cognitive and emotional regulation, my, my CBT therapist training might be appropriate. Am I answering your question? Mm -hmm. okay. So in other words, um, you don't put the goals on, but, but yeah, so in, in doing this, or in doing any one of this, I'm not uh, just doing it for the sake of doing it all, you need CBT. I'm doing it because you can understand, and I can understand, and we can understand together, that it's related to some kind of project goal, intentionality that you have. That could be the, that's the, the framework. But I kind of see, we see the relationship. We make, we establish the relationship. Um, so early on today, you kind of reinforced the importance of every relationship and just developing that rapport with your client. And just near the end, you you know kind of went back there, and then we're talking about support, life enhancing projects. And in my experience working with suicidal people, um, that's kind of the very thing that breaks that rapport. And so that, I imagine that breaks the rapport. Yeah, yeah we're okay. like really. So I would call that. Uh, based on what I've learned about action theory today, kind of a counselor goal-directed action by focusing on the client's you know, life-sustaining projects. And that kind of ignores their wishes to die. And so I'm kind of curious, I mean, I imagine I have a lot less experience than you do, kind of what your thoughts on that would be. You know, well, I, I, I wanna, that's a good question because I want to make sure I'm, I want to be clear. So we, when I started, I want to talk about sort of recognizing the psychic pain. So lots of clients, if they are thinking of ending their life, are in, you know, you can phrase this in various ways, they're in terrible psychic pain. This is so bad, I can't imagine. When a client says to you, you don't know what it's like, you can't, I, it's, if I have to feel like this, I can't. I can't continue living. I can't do this. That's a psychic pain. Okay, that's that's okay. But think about the fact that you're going to be a psychologist one day. You know, and that's that's not what I'm going to do. I want to I want to join that person in, in experiencing that. I want to, and I hope you don't find this too controversial. I want to recognize his right, in a sense, to take his own life or her right to take his own. Life. Not, not saying it doesn't matter, it does matter, but it's, it's <clears throat> but it's that joining, so it's that's the therapy. So I, I, that's the first thing that we want to do. And that's the first psych psychologically orient orientation that I want to take as a counselor with a person like that. But 
I don't want to feel that all I'm dealing with, I mean, is, is, is psychic pain, and, and you know, just commensurate, commensurate with your psychic pain, and not deal with other parts, because that psychic pain isn't coming from nowhere. It's coming because there's, there's a problem, as you, as you will tell me, in some aspect here, or many aspects of this. But I don't want to rush from that to let's let's talk about big goal directed big life projects and all that kind of stuff. But I don't want to take that and say it's not connected because it is connected. So it's because I haven't had parental relationship that's decent. Uh, I grew up in this way, you know, parents abandoned me or abuse or whatever. Or I haven't, I haven't, you know, my, my father expected so much of me, and my parents expected so much of me, and here I am doing this, and I'm not even employed, and whatever, I'm 35. It's connected. And I've got to, I've got to deal with both of those. I don't know if that's, is that, but absolutely not moving away from that, joining the planet, where the planet is. Which, of course, I think is, is so important in any kind of council. It's not just about, about suicide. It's always important in council. I've got some words that have been going around in my head. Um, and I think, actually, I got them from you, but you haven't said them today. But <laughs> I don't think. Okay. And that is that this is all about something. So when I'm with a client, the question I ask myself is, what is this about? Because it's always about something. And that helps to locate me in terms of how I would respond. No, that's exactly right. What we mean, what this goal directed, that's perfect. Uh, so thank you for saying that. That's a very perfect way of talking about goal directed action. Whatever we're doing, this moment, walking to the book, whatever, this is about something. And what you're doing with the client is this is about something. And what can it be for a client for a client who's who's had some life difficulties such that they would want to take their own life? This is about maybe being heard. Maybe being able to tell my story. Maybe not being labeled or seen as I can explain your problem, your difficulty, your challenges. I can explain your challenges because you came from this kind of a family or you don't have this kind of education or you're taking drugs or whatever. You're putting my labels on. So, but this, but you and I, you and I, the client and the counselor, we're, we're, we're negotiating. We have, this has to be about something. So, um, it's not, I mean, there's lots of things, you know, whenever you do something in, in counseling, whenever you have a particular response, uh, it has to be genuine for you. But it wouldn't be, it, 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 I use in counseling, I said to my client, what is this about for you? No. What is this about for you? It gets them articulating what, what's happening here for me. If you said, to them. So that, that's an, I like that phrase. I like to think like that phrase because if I said to the client, what are your goals? You know, I mean, that frightens everybody. What are my goals? I'm supposed to have goals? Oh my God. <laughs> now that I'm going to do one thing my own life, I've got to have goals. <laughs> um, so, you know, to say goals, that's why I was kind of not sort of wanting to say the word goals before I was answering the other questions, but, but what is this about for you is a question that can be a little bit more sort of grounded in the media that I think that would be useful. I want to just go back to the, I don't know your name unfortunately, but the gentleman at the back who asked about the title of the book. Yes. And, and uh, I mean, I quite agree with you that we don't want to think, and so, so it does give a, a, an assumption that some patients are suicidal and some patients aren't, and it's kind of a category or a personality or whatever. And that's, it's, it's a person who's attempted suicide or, you know, et cetera. But I can see for the shorthand, why you sell books, et cetera. It's okay, guys, you've tired me out. It's my turn. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't think you're paying me for any <laughs> Thank you very much. Very enjoyable session.